Of the events which took place at the Norton Mine on October 18th and 19th, 1894, I have no desire to speak. A sense of duty to science is all that impels me to recall, in the last years of my life, scenes and happenings fraught with a terror doubly acute because I cannot wholly define it. But I believe that before I die I should tell what I know of the, shall I say, transition of Juan Ramiro. My name and origin need not be related to posterity. In fact, I fancy it is better that they should not be, for when a man suddenly migrates to the states of the colonies, he leaves his past behind him. Besides, what I once was is not in the least relevant to my narrative, save perhaps the fact that during my service in India I was more at home amongst white-bearded native teachers than amongst my brother officers. I had delved not a little into odd Eastern lore when overtaken by the calamities which brought about my new life in America's vast West, a life wherein I found it well to accept a name, my present one, which is very common and carries no meaning. In the summer and autumn of 1894, I dwelt in the drear expanses of the Cactus Mountains, employed as a common laborer at the celebrated Norton Mine, whose discovery by an aged prospector some years before had turned the surrounding region from a nearly unpeopled waste to a seething cauldron of sordid life. A cavern of gold lying deep beneath a mountain lake, had enriched its venerable finder beyond his wildest dreams, and now formed the seat of extensive tunneling operations on the part of the corporation to which it had finally been sold. Additional grottoes had been found, and the yield of yellow metal was exceedingly great, so that a mighty and heterogeneous army of miners toiled day and night in the numerous passages and rock hollows. The superintendent of Mr. Arthur, often discussed the singularity of the local geological formations, speculating on the probable extent of the chain of caves, and estimating the future of the titanic mining enterprises. He considered the auriferous cavities the result of the action of water, and believed the last of them would soon be opened. It was not long after my arrival and employment that Juan Ramiro came to the Norton Mine. One of the large herd of unkempt Mexicans attracted thither from the neighboring country, he at first attracted attention only because of his features, which, though plainly of the red Indian type, were yet remarkable for their light color and refined conformation, being vastly unlike those of the average greaser or paiute of the locality. It is curious that although he differed so widely from the mass of Hispanicized and tribal Indians, Ramiro gave not the least impression of Caucasian blood. It was not the Castilian conquistador or the American pioneer, but the ancient and noble Aztec, whom imagination called to view when the silent peon would rise in the early morning and gaze in fascination at the sun as it crept above the eastern hills. Meanwhile, stretching out his arms to the orb as if in the performance of some rite whose nature he did not himself comprehend. But save for his face, Ramiro was not in any way suggestive of nobility. Ignorant and dirty, he was at home amongst the other brown-skinned Mexicans, having come, so I was afterward told, from the very lowest sort of surroundings. He had been found as a child in a crude mountain hut, the only survivor of an epidemic which had stalked lethally by. Near the hut, close to a rather unusual rock fissure, had lain two skeletons, newly picked by vultures and presumably forming the sole remains of his parents. No one recalled their identity and they were soon forgotten by the many. Indeed, the crumbling of the adobe hut and the closing of the rock fissure by a subsequent avalanche had helped to efface even the scene from recollection. Reared by a Mexican cattle thief who had given him his name, Juan differed little from his fellow. The attachment which Ramiro manifested toward me was undoubtedly commenced through the quaint and ancient Hindu ring which I wore when not engaged in active labor. Of its nature and manner of coming into my possession I cannot speak. It was my last link with a chapter of my life forever closed, and I valued it highly. Soon I observed that the odd-looking Mexican was likewise interested, eyeing it with an expression that banished all suspicion of mere covetousness. Its hoary hieroglyphs seemed to stir some faint recollection in his untutored but active mind, though he could not possibly have beheld their like before, 
Within a few weeks after his advent, Ramiro was like a faithful servant to me. This notwithstanding the fact that I was myself but an ordinary miner, our conversation was necessarily limited. He knew but a few words of English, while I found my Oxonian Spanish was something quite different from the patois of the peon of New Spain. The event which I am about to relate was unheralded by long premonitions. Though the man Ramiro had interested me, and though my ring had affected him peculiarly, I think that neither of us had any expectation of what was to follow when the great blast was set off. Geological considerations had dictated an extension of the mine directly downward from the deepest part of the subterranean area, and the belief of the superintendent that only solid rock would be encountered had led to the placing of a prodigious charge of dynamite. With this work, Ramiro and I were not connected. Wherefore, our first knowledge of extraordinary conditions came from others. The charge, heavier perhaps than had been estimated, had seemed to shake the entire mountain. Windows in shanties on the slope outside were shattered by the shock, whilst miners throughout the nearer passages were knocked from their feet. Jewel Lake, which lay above the scene of action, heaved as in a tempest. Upon investigation, it was seen that a new abyss yawned indefinitely below the seat of the blast, an abyss so monstrous that no handy line might fathom it, nor any lamp illuminate it. Baffled, the excavator sought a conference with the superintendent, who ordered great lengths of rope to be taken to the pit, and spliced and lowered without cessation till a bottom might be discovered. Shortly afterward, the pale-faced workmen apprised the superintendent of their failure. Firmly, though respectfully, they signified their refusal to revisit the chasm, or indeed to work further in the mine until it might be sealed. Something beyond their experience was evidently confronting them, for so far as they could ascertain, the void below was infinite. The superintendent did not reproach them. Instead, he pondered deeply and made plans for the following day. The night shift did not go on that evening. At two in the morning, a lone coyote on the mountain began to howl dismally. From somewhere within the works, a dog barked in answer either to the coyote or to something else. A storm was gathering around the peaks of the range, and weirdly shaped clouds scudded horribly across the blurred patch of celestial light which marked a gibbous moon's attempt to shine through many layers of cirrostratus vapors. It was Ramiro's voice coming from the bunk above that awakened me, a voice excited and tense with some vague expectation I could not understand. Madre de Dios! El sonido! Ese sonido! Oiga, vid! Lo, oiga, vid! Señor, that sound! I listened, wondering what sound he meant. The coyote, the dog, the storm, all were audible. The last named, now gaining ascendancy as the wind shrieked more and more frantically. Flashes of lightning were visible through the bunkhouse window. I questioned the nervous Mexican, repeating the sounds I had heard. El coyote, el perro, el viento. But Romero did not reply. Then he commenced whispering as in awe. El ritmo, señor. El ritmo de la tierra. That throb down in the ground. And now I also heard, heard and shivered and without knowing why. Deep, deep below me was a sound, a rhythm, just as the peon had said, which though exceedingly faint, yet dominated even the dog, the coyote, and the increasing tempest. To seek to describe it was useless, for it was such that no description is possible. Perhaps it was like the pulsing of the engines far down in a great liner. As sense from the deck, yet it was not so mechanical, not so devoid of the element of the life and consciousness. Of all its qualities, remoteness in the earth most impressed me. To my mind rushed fragments of a passage in Joseph Glanville, which Poe had quoted with tremendous effect. The vastness, profundity, and unsearchableness of his works, which have a depth in them greater than the well of Democritus. Suddenly, Ramiro leaped from his bunk, pausing before me to gaze at the strange ring on my hand, which glistened queerly in every flash of lightning, and then staring intently in the direction of the mine shaft. I also rose, and both of us stood motionless for a time, straining our ears as the uncanny rhythm seemed more and more to take on a vital quality. 
Then, without apparent volition, we began to move toward the door whose rattling in the gale held a comforting suggestion of earthly reality. The chanting in the depths, for such the sound now seemed to be, grew in volume and distinctness, and we felt irresistibly urged out into the storm and thence to the gaping blackness of the shaft. We encountered no living creature, for the men of the night shift had been released from duty, and were doubtless at the dry gulch settlement pouring sinister rumors into the ear of some drowsy bartender. From the watchman's cabin, however, gleamed a small square of yellow light like a guardian eye. I dimly wondered how the rhythmic sound had affected the watchman, but Ramiro was moving more swiftly now, and I followed without pausing. As we descended the shaft, the sound beneath grew definitely composite. It struck me as horribly like a sort of oriental ceremony, with beating of drums and chanting of many voices. I have, as you are aware, been much in India. Ramiro and I moved without material hesitancy through drifts and down ladders, ever toward the thing that allured us, yet ever with a pitifully helpless fear and reluctance. At one time I fancied I had gone mad. This was when, on wondering how our way was lighted in the absence of lamp or candle, I realized that the ancient ring on my finger was glowing with eerie radiance, diffusing a pallid luster through the damp, heavy air around. It was without warning that Ramiro, after clambering down one of the many wide ladders, broke into a run and left me alone. Some new and wild note in the drumming and chanting, perceptible but slightly to me, had acted on him in a startling fashion, and with a wild outcry he forged ahead unguided in the cavern's gloom. I heard his repeated shrieks before me as he stumbled awkwardly along the level places and scrambled madly down the rickety ladders, and frightened as I was, I yet retained enough of my perception to note that his speech, when articulate, was not of any sort known to me. Harsh but impressive polysyllables had replaced the customary mixture of bad Spanish and worse English, and of these only the oft-repeated cry, Hutzilipochtli, seemed in the least familiar. Later I definitely placed that word in the works of a great historian and shuddered when the association came to me. That awful night was composite but fairly brief, beginning just as I reached the final cavern of the journey. Out of the darkness immediately ahead burst a final shriek from the Mexican, which was joined by such a chorus of uncouth sound as I could never hear again and survive. In that moment it seemed as if all the hidden terrors and monstrosities of earth had become articulate in an effort to overwhelm the human race. Simultaneously the light from my ring was extinguished and I saw a new light glimmering from lower space but a few yards ahead of me. I had arrived at the abyss which was now redly aglow and which had evidently swallowed up the unfortunate Ramiro. Advancing, I peered over the edge of that chasm which no line could fathom, and which was now a pandemonium of flickering flame and hideous uproar. At first I beheld nothing but a seething blur of luminosity, but then shapes, all infinitely distant, began to detach themselves from the confusion, and I saw... Was it Juan Ramiro? But God, I dare not tell you what I saw... Some power from heaven coming to my aid obliterated both sights and sounds in such a crash as may be heard when two universes collide in space. Chaos supervened and I knew the peace of oblivion. I hardly know how to continue since conditions so singular are involved, but I will do my best. Not even trying to differentiate betwixt the real and the apparent. When I awakened, I was safe in my bunk, and the red glow of dawn was visible at the window. Some distance away, the lifeless body of Juan Romero lay upon a table, surrounded by a group of men, including the camp doctor. The men were discussing the strange death of the Mexican as he lay asleep, a death seemingly connected in some way with the terrible bolt of lightning which had struck and shaken the mountain. No direct cause was evident, and an autopsy failed to show any reason why Ramiro should not be living. Uh, snatches of conversation indicated beyond a doubt that neither Ramiro nor I had left the bunkhouse during the night, that neither of us had been awake during the frightful storm which had passed over the Cactus Range. 
That storm, said men who had ventured down the mine shaft, had caused extensive caving in and had completely closed the deep abyss which had created so much apprehension the day before. When I asked the watchman what sounds he had heard prior to the mighty thunderbolt, he mentioned a coyote, a dog, and the snarling mountain wind. Nothing more. Nor do I doubt his word. Upon the resumption of work, Superintendent Arthur called upon some especially dependable men to make a few investigations around the spot where the gulf had appeared. Though hardly eager, they obeyed, and a deep boring was made. The results were very curious. The roof of the void as seen when it was open was not by any means thick, yet now the drills of the investigators met what appeared to be a limitless extent of solid rock. Finding nothing else, not even gold, the superintendent abandoned his attempts, but a perplexed look occasionally steals over his countenance as he sits thinking at his desk. One other thing is curious. Shortly after waking on that morning after the storm, I noticed the unaccountable absence of my Hindu ring from my finger. I had prized it greatly, yet nevertheless felt a sensation of relief at its disappearance. If one of my fellow miners appropriated it, he must have been quite clever in disposing of his booty, for despite advertisements and a police search, the ring was never seen again. Somehow I doubt if it was stolen by mortal hands, for many strange things were taught me in India. The opinion of my whole experience varies from time to time. In broad daylight and at most seasons, I am apt to think the greater part of it a mere dream. But sometimes in the autumn, about two in the morning, when the winds and animals howl dismally, there comes from inconceivable depths below a damnable suggestion of rhythmical throbbing. And I feel that the transition of Juan Romero was a terrible one indeed.'